Hi everyone, and welcome to Press X, the Geek Show's dedicated video games. Are we a podcast still? We're on YouTube as well. What are we? We are many things. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I am the man of many things, also known as Rob, and also joining me today are two other men of many things. Of there is Mark. Hello. And on the other side is Andy. Hello. They're not in opposite sides because they're going to have a fight, by the way. I just want to make that clear. One well, being one. I, I haven't prepared. This is not like the <laughs> Thunderdome. It's not like two men enter, one man leaves. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, right, okay. Today, we're going to be talking about the, well, it's kind of the obvious thing, I suppose, to talk about at some point when you do a show about video games, and that is collector's editions, and whether they're actually worth it. So, starting off, guys, do you have any collector's editions? I have far too many collector's editions, Um I kind of went through a phase where if it was released on collector's edition, I would buy it on collector's edition rather than the normal edition. I went through that phase as well. Uh, that was definitely, very, well, I say last generation. That was last Nintendo generation. But I've kind of held back a little bit more for this PS4 Switch generation, and it's just been like the select few I've been picking up on them because buyer's remorse a lot of the time. Yeah. What about you, Andy? Well, I've never bought a collector's edition, but it isn't because I don't believe in buying collector's editions, because I think some of them are really good. Okay. But I just think that, is it worth it? I know that's the aim of the show, but Mm. it's kind of a mix. See, are we covering collector's editions, the big, massive, big, massive box ones? Well, or also included (laughs) special edition ones where it's like... Five quid extra and you get a pamphlet and art cards and See, all this, that jazz. This is the thing. That's one of the things that I wanted us to actually uh, discuss because it used to be the case that that was the collector's edition, right? Mm. The collector's edition, when you go back far enough, I mean, uh, my history in video games is uh, a lot older than both of you. I, mean, I started playing video games before you guys were even born. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not loading my old manness. Of you in any way <laughs> <laughs> is old madness a term? I don't know. <laughs> the thing is, back when I started playing video games, you didn't really have things like collectors' editions. They didn't really exist. We were just happy to be playing video games. You shove the cassette in, wait for the game to actually load up, and then you have a great time playing the game, even if it was too difficult. We didn't have all these fancy pants controllers with trigger buttons and stuff like that. We had a joystick with one button. <laughs> that button did everything. <laughs> so the whole idea of collector's editions way back then was a weird thing, and they didn't really appear until like the nineties, the late nineties, did they? Mm. It's like Nintendo sixty four and PS one era, wasn't it? Yeah. Even then, I would still see it. It's more of a recent thing. Well, this is the thing: the collector's editions that appeared then. I suppose you could say they were worth the money to a degree, because <laughs> it wasn't that you were getting a lot more with them. You were paying a little bit more, but you were getting a little bit more. So you were getting like an art book or something like that. Something that you weren't getting in the normal edition. Something that was substantial that you could actually hold in your hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But as the games market has become more and more saturated, it seems like there's less and less effort being put into collector's editions. And what used to be a collector's edition is now just classed as a special edition. Mm. You know? Yeah. And then... It. Yeah, and then the collector's edition is something overblown and ridiculous, but really cheaply made. Exactly. Well, a lot of them are really cheap. There is some hidden gems out there, but a lot, the majority are overpriced stuff. But the thing that I've noticed is that there has been a decline in putting stuff like maps and manuals in yes. titles. Okay, I and then un- they start putting in collector stuff. I can understand the manuals to a degree, because generally the tutorials that you have in games cover the manual for the most part. That's fine. Yeah. But the map is something that used to make a nice addition. I mean, when they brought Morrowind out and it had that lovely map inside the Morrowind box. Mm. Exactly. It's weird. It's like it's weird how you saw like uh, like stuff like uh, a lot of the GRPGs like years yeah. ago. Like I know like stuff like um, Link to the Past and. Uh, I can't remember, it was Illusion of Time, I think I had for this, uh, the snares. And it was like, 
oh yeah, you get that with it. The map with the map's all included. Then it kind of was like stuff here and there, it was like stuff like Skyrim or GDA, you would get the map. And now like you'd get a map only if you get the collector's edition and it's like Oh my god, you've yeah. ju- you've literally just reminded me of something, right? It used to be the case. I think it was especially with games on the Atari ST, the Commodore Amiga, and on the PC. You know the old big box games that you used to get? Yes. Right. Yeah. Like Diablo and things, wasn't it? Like Diablo and things like that. But those games, they were basically collector's editions. Every single one of those games that they just sold as normal versions. These days, you would probably classify them as a collector's edition. Because, remember those games? They used to have things like a cord wheel in and stuff like that, where a level cord you had to put in using the wheel and the manual, and you had all these little extra bits Mm -hmm. Inside mm-hmm. that big box, right? yes, and yeah, that was basically a collector's edition when you get exactly. right down to it. But you don't even get that on PC now, you get like a DVD case with a disc in, and that's you don't it. even get that now, Rob. <laughs> you, <just get laughs> you, the like, yeah, you, get, like, you, might, you might get a cord if you're lucky. Yeah. I, mean, well, I mean, I bought, I bought the boxed edition of Mass Effect Andromeda, right? Yeah, and it had a cord in it. You think that's bad? <laughs> Do you remember the uh. Epic edition of Bulletstorm. Oh, yeah. Mm. That game that they were trying to push as, oh, it's going to be amazing. And they had the Epic edition, which you paid a little bit more for. And you know what you got in there? You got an invite to the Gears of War 3 beta. Wow. (laughs) That was the Epic edition. Wow. Halo Halo 3 was even worse. Remember Halo 3? That was Halo uh, Reach thing, wasn't it, that they offered? No, no, Halo 3 had that special edition case, but the problem with the special edition case was that it broke the discs that were in it. Oh. It scratched them all to hell. Oh, yeah, I remember hearing about that. Um, <laughs> I can't remember, yeah, that was stupid. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, that the, thing, the one thing that is weird now is that physical games, to have the physical version of the game, is now becoming the collector's edition. Yeah. And it's like limited run. Yeah. They've got an entire empire based on just putting on indie games onto a cartridge or onto a disc. And it's like, yeah, it's weird. For limited run, I can understand they've exploited a niche in the market because I hate to say it, and I've said this loads of times, everybody collects something and gamers will collect games. I mean, one of the things that's always puzzled me is this whole thing about, uh, let's see, which one was it? Uh, Final Fantasy XII. Let's use that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Final Fantasy XII has just come out again, re-released. They called it the Zodiac Age, yeah? Mm. yeah? But when it came out originally on the PS2, you had the UK version, which was just Final Fantasy XII. Then you had the American Collector's Edition version, which was basically what's now called the Steelbook Edition, and it had a bonus DVD, and that was it. Mm. Right. And you paid a lot more for it. Yeah, because it's just... I think the people see the word collectors and they're like, it's going to be worth something. I'll buy this. And then nine times out of ten, it's not. I think the biggest criminal law was Fable 2. Oh. Do you guys remember the collector's edition for Fable 2? I don't. Uh, is that the one where it looked like a book? No. Was that Fable 3? That was probably Fable 3. That was probably Fable 3, yeah. Do you guys actually remember the collector's edition of Fable 2? No. Not fondly. But, uh, um... I, don't, I didn't actually own an Xbox 360, so... It doesn't matter whether you owned an Xbox 360, this is notorious. Yeah, See, did it have, like, a comic or something? Right? Or something. Fable 2, the collector's edition, there's the special case, a set of Fable-themed tarot cards, and a little bobblehead, right? The problem is... That that was what was announced as the collector's edition. You had two discs for Fable 2, the box, everything like that. You had all sorts of things that were going to go in there. But the team at Lionhead, a problem during production caused them to scrap all of the extra bits, leaving the special edition as nothing more than a crappy DVD with a few lame features on it. Oh, I do remember that now. So, there was something else I got where you got a DVD and I had a making of or something like that, and it was like a little 20 minute DVD, and I was just like, oh, yeah, that's I, very cool. Yeah, I did get that with Sound Hill 2. Yeah. 
but I think that was just a normal edition. I think it just they just released that. They still do special editions now. We had a edition of A Rose in the Twilight sent to us for review on the PS Vita, and that had a lovely box with a few extra bits in, and a really nice kind of golem, uh, squeezy, plastic guitar. You know, like those stress balls. It's uh, made out of the same material as those, which yeah. was uh, it was a really nice little uh, set. And I've noticed that press kits seem to be the new collector's edition. Because mm. mm-hmm. when you get the press kit, when we got the press kit for Alien Isolation on the PS3, it came in a really nice box and it had like a little USB stick and uh, in the shape of a robot and uh, one of those compacted down T-shirts and various bits like that. Mm. Yeah. Oh, so that was really nice. And that's the sort of thing I'd love to see in a collector's edition is mm. that mm. sort of thing that actually associates itself with the game. And it's pretty decently made. What I don't like is all this cheap plasticky crap. Like, you remember the Bioshock one where they had the Big Daddy? Uh, yeah, but it was it was awfully made. It was just this <laughs> horrible, horrible thing. Yeah, mm. I'm just getting the Octopath Traveler Rame Collector's Edition because it's a GRPG. I really love the demo, and I was like, it's an extra twenty quid. I think it was twenty or thirty quid on top. Yeah, and I was like, it comes with a, a pop up book, and I was like, oh yeah, that's a cool little idea. The pop up book is glued onto the box. So you can't even remove the pop-up book and look through it properly. You've got to open the box all the way. So it doesn't look good. And inside that, there's like a coin. I was like that. So you get a collectible coin, which you're never, ever going to use. Yeah. And you get the game. And that's it. That was the same price as the Xenoblade Chronicles X. Sorry, the Xenoblade Chronicles 2 Collector's Edition. Yeah. Which was exactly the same price. That had a box, which also had a collectible box inside it, a nice special design on the box, which is reversible or two-sided. Yeah. It had an art book, and I don't mean a 12-page pamphlet. It's got a 300-page art book. Yeah, the Xenoblade one was really good. Mm. It's That's not something I would have bought anyway. It had a soundtrack sample, which had, like, 30 tracks on, yeah. which is decent because the the normal one's like five discs. Yeah. A steelbook version of the game and, well, the normal version of the game. So it's like you get two cases yeah. inside it. And I think there was something else as well, but I can't remember. And it's like both of them were the same price and one of them feels like it's got a lot more to it than the other. It's that weight to it. I mean, uh, do you guys remember the uh, Dead Space 2 one? One of my biggest gripes with collector's editions is when they do, you know, the gimmick. So Dead Space 2 had the laser cutter. Oh, yeah. Right. But the problem with the Dead Space 2 laser cutter was it was this, it was like the Bioshock thing is this cheap plasticky thing. It's like, the you know, the Master Chief helmet in the Halo one. Yeah. Yeah. It was this cheap molded plastic piece of crap. A lot like, uh, you know, the the limited edition. Oh God, I forgot about this. Are you, just are you going to call? Are you going to talk about the Fallout Four here? Oh no, <laughs> <laughs> no, because I forgot about that. Thank you for reminding me. But no, uh, this is all the the limited edition figure of uh, what is first in the Assassin's Creed Special Edition. Yeah, well, oh, yeah. but um. There was. Did anybody see the Assassin's Creed Syndicate Special Edition, the Big Ben Edition? Oh God! Right, it came. Right, they put. It basically had a model, like decently sized model of the main character, or one of the main characters. But you got a download code for the game, so you didn't even get the disc in it. Yeah. Oh no, that's worse. That. But like, that <laughs> that's something to try and reframe Red Dead Redemption, isn't it? Yes. Yes, they did. You get you get this massive, massive loot box full of stuff, but you don't even get the game with it. Yeah. Mm. It's like, so why would you want to pay 60, 70 quid for Tart? Mm. It's, a, it's ridiculous. That does actually lead us on to an interesting bit, though. Some of the bizarre things that they've included in collector's editions. Oh, right? God. And uh, we are going to end the show with the most expensive collector's editions, right? <laughs> I do have that, so don't worry. We'll be doing a rundown of those. But, yeah, uh, some of the bizarre things that they've included in special editions. Do you guys remember Fear 3? 
Yes. I remember it being a thing, but I don't I remember I don't remember ever seeing it to buy. Yeah. Fear three, the collector's edition, was notorious for one particular reason. Because there was a creepy glow in the dark statue of a pregnant lady where the fetus was the bit that glowed in the dark. Oh yeah, I remember seeing that. Oh, yeah. God. That was kind of on the level of Remember the Dead Island Riptide Zombie Bait Collector's Edition? <laughs> yeah. It was kind of on the same level as that. You put it on your shelf and, oh, yeah, it's a talking point. No, it isn't. <laughs> it's a talking point. It's like, yeah, people are like, what the hell are you doing with that? Yeah, it's a conversation go, piece. It? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a conversation non-starter. But there are some rarities which I would say a good collector's edition. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. I mean, I feel that a lot of the Nintendo ones, you know, when the Nintendo was putting like an Amiibo in or something like that, uh, so, like yeah. exclusive Amiibo, I quite like them because you're going to find that the Amiibo is useful with the game. Yeah. And they weren't usually a huge amount extra. Like, I feel like a lot of the Nintendo Wii U 3DS titles were pretty good. Yeah. In terms I mean... of it, it's just kind of like. It's some of them that the way they just went a little bit too overboard or stuff. You had some interesting ones. I mean, do you remember the Resident Evil 6 Leather Jacket Edition? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and oh. to Is be fair, like... though, Resident Evil's always had decent ones. Did you see the Resident Evil 7? Yes. That one had a whole thing about it, though, didn't it? Didn't was that, was that one a pop-up book? And then it was arriving, and then it was all, like, broken and stuff like that. Yeah. I remember Capcom haven't had a good track record as of late because they did that um, Marvel vs. Capcom one, wasn't it? And it just looked like it was the Infinity Stones and they were just like basically painted eggs. Mm. But yeah, I mean, the, what was the. Um, there was a really good Resident Evil one a few years back. Was it the one for number four? And it had a chainsaw controller or something like that. Uh, yeah, USB stick, I think it had as well. Yeah, that one was yeah. really cool. Yeah, yeah. I think. I think seven for me though stands out. Um, it came with a full model of the house, but uh, mm. you pressed a button and it played the music and it lit up. Yeah, yeah. And it also came with like a dusty U- uh, VHS tape type of thing. I don't yeah. know if there was anything on it, but I don't think anybody will find out. <laughs> but uh, at least it wasn't like the Call of Duty World at War collector's edition. Is that the night vision goggles? No, the night vision goggles was a great idea and fit with the theme. World at War had that hip flask that you couldn't actually use as a hip flask. Ah. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> the one that, oh, yeah, it's a hip flask. I've always wanted to own one of these because every guy has wanted to own a hip flask, right? It's a thing. <laughs> no matter how much you deny it, every guy has wanted to own a hip flask. <laughs> haven't haven't you? Admit it, guys. You have, haven't you? Yes, definitely. We don't. We don't. We, I've got one for uh, MCM and other cons. See what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and so you know, when you can get a hip flask with a game like Call of Duty, you think, awesome. And yes, I did buy that version. And was I disappointed by the hip flask? <laughs> <laughs> Disappointment doesn't even cut it. This is the one of the things that I always find weird about these collector's editions as well, is that a lot of them aren't worth anything. Mm. Yeah, they don't hold their value. Yeah, they... it depends on what they paid for them, though, as well. I think that, looking at the World at War one now, I think that was 60 quid. So, in a sense, for a collector's edition, it wasn't too much of a difference. Well, let me just bring this up. Do you remember Batman Arkham Asylum? Yeah. Yes. Right. The collector's edition where you had that cheap, plasticky, batarang type thing. <laughs> yeah? Mm, original, yeah? Originally selling at around 80 quid, yeah? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, Amazon have a version of it on the Xbox 360 for £300, because hope is always a good thing. Because it's Amazon. <laughs> eBay have it on there for around the same price as it was selling originally, yeah? Mm. So, yeah. It's basically... I suppose, well, actually, no, eBay also have it for, like, 40 quid, so it's halved in value since 2009. Mm-hmm. Um, that one, because it's Batman, I suppose it's held its value a bit more. Yeah. yeah. But Call of Duty World at War Limited Collector's Edition, originally selling at 60 quid. Now you could probably find it at Caboot Sale. 
Yeah, but, um, definitely. I mean, yeah. The, the issue is, is that a lot of these collector's editions are just far too big. Yeah. And a lot of stores don't actually buy them back. No, um, they don't. Because, because of how big they are, and if it's a game that didn't particularly sell well, they can't shift them. Well, For example, not... can you remember Driver? Yeah. I think yeah. it was on the PS3. I can't remember which one Driver, it was. Driver 3, that would have been. Driver 3. Yeah. That had a collector's edition which had a big car in. Yes, I remember that. At one point, CEX were buying the normal edition for £12. Do you know how much they were buying the collector's edition for? Four. Ten. Wow. Because they couldn't sell it. Yeah, I'm not surprised. The Alien mm. Resurrection one. I'm not surprised. You know that uh, that zombie bait edition of Dead Island Riptide? Yeah. I've seen that being sold in a second-hand store for £30. I've seen mm. the Duke Nukem one in B&M bargains yeah. for five quid. Yeah. It's like they just can't get rid of some of these things. Well, one of the reasons why they can't, right, and this is a key fundamental thing, and this is also one of the reasons why... Uh, Things like collector's editions, Game of the Year editions I'm including in this as well because Game of the Year editions are a pox on gaming society, right? Uh, I'm kind of mixed there because I'm one of these people now if I see a game where I know it's going to get a, collect- a Game of the Year edition, I will wait for it and save the money. Yeah, mm. but the, here's my thing. The reason why I call Game of the Year editions a pox is because they do exactly the same thing that collector's editions do. If the content is on disc, then it's worth the money. Mm-hmm. But most of the time, yeah. the content is behind a cord. And when you when people buy the collector's edition or the game of the year edition, they use the cord, get the content. So basically, what they're selling on is just the normal game plus a couple of bits yeah. extra. That's it. Yeah. But the actual content that is the bit that you might want to be paying for, you don't have access to because it's already been used. So there is no point in you mm-hmm. paying. There's been a rise in games that are actually putting the content on disc, but there have been a lot of games where they didn't do that. But when you look at the collector's editions, historically, collector's editions secondhand have been sold for more than the normal edition, even though the collector's edition at that point is exactly the same as the normal edition. Well, that's the thing. That's the thing that always gets me. It's like you could pay 100 quid for a collector's edition of the game, and if there's a season pass, nine times out of ten, they don't include the season's pass. So you're having to buy the collector's edition plus an extra 30 quid just to get the full experience. And it's like, could you really have just put it in there? Yeah. I mean, what's the point in having all of those extra bits? You know? Exactly, if you're not even getting the full game. Exactly. Yeah. Which kind of leads us on to, uh, you know, is it worth the money? Mm. I always think is that if you think that it's worth the money, it is. Now, I've stopped buying them because... Like I said, after Octopath, I knew that they weren't really worth the money. Uh, I've got the Valkyria Chronicles 4 one ordered because it comes with a tank and I'm not insane. <laughs> um, I guess on a model tank. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, like a vi- it's a vinyl tank. So uh, it's like, I'm assuming it's going to be a, a, a tank of pop vinyl quality. Uh, you hope. You, do, you hope somebody doesn't pull up to your house with a like a real tank and go, this is your collector's edition. No, no, no. I, 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 I'll have you know, I, I know, I know Mark very well now, okay? <laughs> Especially after all the time we spent on Keyframe. I can guarantee you that is exactly <laughs> what he hopes. He does absolutely hope that, mm, that some young lady and the rest of the tank crew will be young ladies. Maybe they will sing and dance as well. We don't know but that they pull up in front of his house in a tank and then they go off exploring the world in their tank. Because yes. Mark lives for Girls Under Panzer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to be honest, that, I, I, was, I wasn't going to mention that one. I was going to mention another one that I'm, I'm going to order, but that was one I was gutted that I actually didn't spend the extra money on to get the collector's edition because you get a lot of... See, Japan seems to do very well with these anime ones. You yes, get, like. They... They put things... soundtracks or drama CDs or posters and all sorts with it. It's weird because you wouldn't think that that would be the case, that the Western video games market, the publishers could actually learn something about collector's editions from Japan. But yeah. there's a lot they could learn from how the Japanese do it. 
Even mm. the anime related ones, the ones that heavily tie into a particular franchise from anime or manga or something like that, they put a lot of effort into uh into the presentation. Yeah. There's actually one that I did that this does bring me on to, and this was a bizarre one, okay? I'm not sure what to make of this one. It was anime related, I suppose, in a roundabout way, but it wasn't Is that the one where you had the uh, the underwear included in it. No, was it Galgun or something like that? Was it Galgun or no? No, I, I'm not talking. Like I'm not talking about Galgun or something like that. I'm talking about uh, Agarest. Do you remember Agarest? Yeah, that had a um, a boob mouse mat with it, didn't it? It didn't just <laughs> have a boob mouse mat with it. It wasn't just a boob mouse mat. Right? A, a love pillow or whatever it was. Yes, there was a very very dodgy pillow with it as well. Isn't this the one we got sent years ago? No, no, that was Senran Kagura. Ah. See, I, I'm kind of like, I would take that over a terrible little figure that falls apart or an art book that's like 10 pages long. Yeah. Or something like that. I, it's like, I look at that and I was like, well, even if I don't want it, there's definitely some weeb out there that does that and sell that on to. Yeah, but would you take that over a uh, $200 mini fridge that can hold little tins of stuff? <laughs> Maybe not. Because that's what came with the collector's edition of Black Ops 3. They called it... <laughs> to, to be fair, though, if you looked at stuff and you... How, how much was it? $200? $200. And you know those that's little cans of Coke that... No, do you know those little cans of Coke that they give out where they give out oh, for free samples? It could hold 12 of those, apparently. Uh, I was going to say if it was a decent size mini fridge. That's no, no, no. <laughs> Basically, what this fridge could hold was one normal size can of cola. <laughs> <laughs> uh, See, I think I think a lot of it comes down, like I say, it comes down to presentation and stuff like that. But it also comes down to like sometimes you just get big things for the sake of it looking big. Yeah. yeah. I mean, sometimes you can get a massive. I think it was an Uncharted or something had a massive box. For <laughs> some, the Fallout, the Fallout Pip Boy edition, it came with the Pip Boy, <laughs> but it also came with a massive box to house it. Now I looked at it, and I was just like. Yeah, that is going to go nowhere. I'm going to have to ch- either chuck that or keep it in case I sell it on. Yeah, and it was just like there, there was no use for this box after I got rid of it. Like after mm. you took the Pip Boy out, and it's just mm. for me the collector's editions is the ones where it it's got a nice art box and it's you can still put it on your shelf. Yeah, for things you can put on your shelf though. Does anybody remember the Sonic Mania collector's edition? Mm. Oh yeah, that was like a. It was it a Mega Drive with a plastic Sonic yeah, was, on top? It was basically like a maybe a full size Mega Drive with a Sonic on the top where if yeah. you press the button, it played the Sega tune. So yeah. I think that's actually a good collectible. I sense. think stuff like that is still pretty cool. Something yeah. that actually relates to it or something that does look good on the shelf, I I tend to find is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I think practicality has to come into it at some point though. Because we don't have unlimited space. Exactly. So you kind of have to go, yeah, I I would love to have this, but uh, do I have the space for it? Is it going to go with the rest of my collection? I think that's one of the things that, uh, that I, I mean, when I look at my own collection and any collector's editions I'm going to be going for, I would automatically go for the things I'm interested in first. And yeah. if there's any other collector's editions I want to buy, I'd look at what's in my collection already and go, okay, what goes with my collection, rather than just buying things at random. Exactly, that's the thing. I mean, something like, I'm going to see like the Duke Nukem statue that came with the game. It's like, who's going to have that on the shelf? Is there anybody who really, really loves Duke Nukem enough that they really need it? Or maybe the Driver Free one again. It's a big car and it's going to take up a significant portion of a shelf. Mm. Whereas you could just have more games on that shelf. Yeah. If they were much more expensive, if they were about 10, 15 quid more expensive and they give you some decent stuff, I'd be happy. I mean, for me, a perfect collector's edition, if it retails for 40 quid and they see it, it's 60 quid, you get an art book, you get the soundtrack with it. Because that's yeah, something an that art art book that's art more than, appeals to yeah, me. An art book that's more than 12 pages, let's see. Yeah, that's an art pamphlet, but like an art an art book book. Um, if they say you get the first DLC with it or something, some of them do. And 
even if it's something like art cards, I seem to appreciate art cards more than a big massive statue. At these I've got days. I've got a crap ton of art cards. Do you remember the um, what was it? Um, Perfect Dark Zero. Do you remember the controversy over that? That was because that was such a beloved title on the N64, and everyone was so hyped for the game, and then it ends up being really bad. No, the, <laughs> that not just that, not just that the game was bad, but the collector's edition was just got awful because they went, "Oh yeah, we're going to charge you more. What are we giving you? A few cards." Yeah, and so. But if, if it's a few cards included with other stuff, that's fine. But yeah, when it's like, art, oh, it's five quid extra, and it's get art cards, and say, like, wow, I, I got the Dragon's Crown Pro Edition the other day. Yeah, and it's a game I loved, and I was like happy to pay it. And it was like it's included in the steel book. You also get these little tarot cards. And I was like, brilliant. Dragon's They're Crown still in the box. And Dragon's Crown is that title where the witch has the headlights that hit her in the face while she's walking. Isn't yeah, it? the dress that doesn't shouldn't never ever stay on somehow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And every time well, she walks forward, she keeps hitting herself in the face. Pretty much. But then I was like, I was like, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine with that. And I was like, I, I bought. Then I was kind of like, well, this is just a PS3 game that they ported onto the PS4. It, like other titles, like Orkami or Valkyria Chronicles, were retailed about twenty quid, fifteen, yeah. twenty. And it's like I've just paid thirty five quid for this. I'm like. Yeah, I've just realised that I've paid like an extra 15, 20 quid for art cards and a steel book. And I was like, yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah. Okay, right. That actually does lead us really nicely on to the last bit. So, guys, right, let's see whether you'd actually pay this amount for these particular collector's editions. This is a list I found from May 2017. So, it may not be totally accurate, but it gives us a good idea. Starting from the lowest figure, Halo 5 Guardians Collector's Edition, $250. And for that, you got a high quality statue of both Master Chief and uh, Spartan Locke. Those were the centerpiece. You got uh, a few of the goodies a Metal Earth Guardian model, Steelbook, Spartan Locks, classified orders, and dossiers, and digital content for a Warzone REQ bundle, and the animated Halo Fall of Reach miniseries. So for two hundred and fifty dollars, that's not too bad, is it? No, because you're looking at a hundred and something, aren't you? Yeah, pounds. So and it came in a big box. Bad. It came in a well, big box. I've just found it for seventy nine ninety nine. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so I found all of the governs, all the extra stuff for thirty five quid. Yeah. So basically, it hasn't held its value, right? Mm. So let's move on to uh, Destiny Two. Destiny 2. I wouldn't pay five quid for it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care what's in it. It's yeah. Destiny. $250 again, right? And for that, you basically got uh, a uh, snazzy Frontier messenger type bag, which you can have as either a backpack or a messenger bag. Now, I just want to point out that my bag that I bought from uh, Amazon, which technically, I suppose, is a wish bag, my bag also can double as a messenger bag and a backpack and also a hold. Also, my bag is automatically better since it can do three different things instead of your two. And I paid £15 for mine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you'll get the Frontier kit, which includes a solar panel USB charger. Ooh, very swanky. They're not very good. I've tried them. Paracord, solar blanket and limited edition steelbook case. Is that worth 250 quid? I think not. No, I don't think so. That's like one of the ones you'd pay like an extra fifteen quid for. Yeah, again, I don't know what two... a solar blanket is. Yeah, a solar blanket is one of those things that I suppose keeps you warm with the sun. It's basically foil. That's a weird combination. <laughs> that would be useful for my trip to the moon. <laughs> yeah, if you want to be wrapped up like a Kit Kat, then fine. Gears of War Four Collector's Edition again, two hundred and fifty dollars. Seems to be a common price for collector's mm. editions in America. This two hundred and fifty dollars. So for that, you got a statue of J.D. Phoenix, Marcus Phoenix's errant son, who is riding a cog bike, wielding a lancer at the same time. So he's supposed to look kind of cool. Probably not, though. The statue isn't all you get. It also comes with a frag grenade keychain, not an actual frag grenade, a lithograph, a steel <laughs> book, season pass, and a copy of the game. 
Now, I like the fact that they specified that there is actually a copy of the game in there, just in case you were wondering. Yeah, because some actually don't have the game. Yeah, yeah I know. Code. Some don't have the game. It's bizarre. How can you sell a collector's edition of the game <laughs> and not include the most important bit? <laughs> Did you like this game that you've never played? Well, you can get the collector's stuff instead. You know, yes. there's some disappointed people out there that have actually bought that and then to figure out, hang on, there's no game in it. So anyway, $250 also got you the Titanfall Collector's Edition, which um, made a big splash when it appeared. There's a 18-inch statue showing a Titan and pilots in battle, which even features some of the functions, LED lighting and various things like that. It's a big piece at 18 inches, so, you know, it's kind of impressive. You also got a 190-page art book, as well as a Titan schematic poster, and that's basically it. But that's not too bad. I actually think that's quite substantial Mm -hmm. for the price. An 18-inch statue is, if you think, 12 inches is 30 centimeters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's quite a substantial piece that you could have on your shelf, and it would make a good talking point. I Even love the that. Gears of War one, I would, I, I just look at the like what it looks like, and it looks like a pretty big figure. Like so, it's, yeah, uh... yeah. The Titanfall Two Vanguard Collector's Edition was also two hundred and fifty dollars. That one had, you know, like the Master Chief helmet. Uh, that yeah. one had a Vanguard pilot's helmet instead, which is a one-to-one scale helmet and features multiple light-up features. The faceplate even has a functional tactical ARC rail system and adjustable interior head strap and display stand. And you get a uh, dog tag flash drive, a pilot SRS field journal, squad morale patches, and Vanguard Shema scarf. See, one of the thing, the noticeable things I've noticed with these collector's editions that that's super expensive is that there's a running theme is that a lot of these games are ones you can get for next to nothing. Yep. And following on that trend is Mass Effect Andromeda collector's edition. <laughs> <laughs> Let me guess. You get a ship with it. No, you get a Nomad. If you got a ship with it, I would have bought three of these and had, like, space battles. You know this. (laughs) Oh, yeah, you did, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, you I know, almost heard Andy, and then I was going to see you actually do get a shit with it. It's just called the key (laughs) input. See, (laughs) yeah, I know. The only reason I know this is because I am... You remember the character from Lego, the movie? You know, the spaceship guy? That's me. Yeah. You know, yeah. that that is literally me. If you if you say spaceship, I go where. <laughs> so anyway, Mass Effect Andromeda had the uh, Nomad. You know the little uh, off road vehicle. Uh, this yeah. is two hundred and sixty two hundred seventy dollars. This was so it had the Nomad and it had uh, various other things. And it had here is the thing, right? One of the puzzling things about Mass Effect Andromeda. BioWare released two versions of the remote control Nomad, a regular for $100 and a limited edition for $200. The catch is that neither one of them came with the game, right? (laughs) BioWare then said that you could purchase a bundle that adds on the game for another $60 or the deluxe edition for $70. But why would you purchase the bundle when the game was cheaper? See, this is the thing. You could buy the game separately on its own. You didn't have to buy the Nomad. Moving on, Final Fantasy XV, Collector's Edition, $270. Ah, uh, was this the Regalia? That was the one of the... The car. No, no, this one... Uh... That was the one of the Play Arts figure in, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, this one was the Noctis Play Arts figure. Uh. Uh, I think the Regalia one has since superseded this one, hasn't it? Yeah, the the one of the figures dropped by quite a lot. I think that last time I saw that was about 90 quid. Yeah. I think, I don't know if it's because people aren't as interested in Final Fantasy XV as much now, or...? Well, it's not that... They did a reprint of that one, didn't they? They did. But there's the one with the regalia now, which I think, uh, because it's a car, it's so much more... so So much much more more desirable. Yeah. Moving on from there, Kingdom of Amalur, the Reckoning's signature edition, $275. (laughs) <laughs> All right, that's um, an obscure game. Plus, it's out of print. Yep. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming most of these are going to be out of print in general, but it's hard to get that game in general. So it's yeah, yeah, I can understand this. Yeah, but here's the thing: this one is a bit different from the ones that have come previously. The collector's edition released with three different types of collector's edition. 
each of them was limited to a certain number. There was an $80 special edition, which only had 2,000 copies, a $200 collector's edition limited to 700 copies, and this signature edition of $275, which only had 300 copies. And I like the fact that the signature edition is truly limited, only 300 copies all over the world, yeah? Mm. But for that, what you got was a signed limited edition of McFarlane Toys Prismere Troll Figure. There's only 300 of those that were actually made, and they were only made for the signature edition. So that's it, 300 and that's it, right? And those were signed by Todd McFarlane. Todd McFarlane's sketches and screen prints, original lithographs signed by Ken Ralston, parchment maps of Amalo's Fairlands, Amalo-themed seven-piece dice set, full set of 40 Destiny cards, tarot cards basically, uh, the soundtrack to Kingdoms of Amalo, and exclusive DLC, so a DLC that was only with this version. Mm. So that's, that's a different thing, isn't it? That's yeah. a lot. Dirt 3, $300 for the uh, collector's edition. And um, with that, you got uh, Ken Block Jim Carner Rallying Fiesta. I think it's a remote control car. <laughs> yeah, not the real Fiesta. <laughs> no, 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 it wasn't the real one. Crisis 2's Maximum Graphics Edition actually came with a graphics card <laughs> <laughs> for $300. Oh, I love that. It's br- <laughs> That's superb, isn't it? The collector's Depends edition. on the graphics card, though. Yeah, but this is the thing. You need the graphics card to run the game <laughs> on the PC. Oh, God. So that, I think, is a kind of genius. Middle Earth Shadow Wars Mithril Edition, $300. Uh, you got a big-ass uh, Nazgul in the middle of that and all sorts of other bits. And I think you got a, a ring as well, you know, like a kind of... The uh, one ring. I don't think it's the one ring, but I think it's a ring linked to the game, the story, that sort of thing. The 12-inch uh, Targoroth Balrog versus Khan and Drake statue, which that's a big fantasy battle, and that would sit nicely on your shelf next to your Titan from Titanfall, which I think mm. those two would make a great kind of set piece. Mm. Much mm. better than the Zombie Bait edition <laughs> of Dead Island. $1,300 would get you Resident Evil 6's premium edition. Is that the Jais? Yes. Yeah. That is the leather jacket. It's just a shame about the game. Yeah. Now, this is where we start getting into stupid prices because I the think prices. I know where you're going, here, Rob. The prices <laughs> up to now haven't been stupid. Okay. So, for a hundred and eighty thousand dollars, what do you think you got? Oh, that was what was it? Saints Row or something that gave no, you like a no? It's not Saints Row. Or something like that. It's, it's not Saints Row. This this was a racing game. Forza. No, it wasn't Forza. It was Grid 2. Uh. Grid 2 did a mono edition for $180,000, which is basically 125000 quid, right? Mm. And with that edition, now I remember this because we actually received the press release for this when it was coming out. With that edition, you got a copy of the game, obviously, and you got a Grid 2 branded racing helmet and race suit complete with boots and gloves. Hmm. So you could actually have the full Grid 2 kit. You could wear it and cosplay in it if you wanted. You could go to sleep in it, whatever you wanted to do. Right? You got a PlayStation 3. And last but not least, you got a street legal BAC Mono supercar. Ooh. So you basically got a car with this game. <laughs> a fully working single-seater road car. Well, to be fair, that's probably a good deal then. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think that's that's a pretty good deal. Now, number two on this list, and I'm not too sure whether this matches up to... Uh, see, there's two versions of this. There's the Dying Light My Apocalypse Edition, right? Mm. Which they've rated at $386,000. Now, the My Apocalypse Edition of Dying Light... Basically, you got uh, zombie survival parkour lessons, uh, be the zombie match in game with the dev team, a trip to Techland in Poland to meet the team, dying light branded night vision goggles, and adult diapers. Seriously, uh, four <laughs> signed steelbook editions of dying light, two top of the line Razer Tiamat headphones, a life sized volatile figurine, and your face skinned onto a character model in the game. Right? Mm. But there is. Another 
I, version, I know where you're going with this. There is the Dying Light, the following Spotlight yes. Edition, which nobody is sure whether this is a real thing or not. And this, if it's a real thing, it would be the most expensive video game in the world, but I'll get to that in a second. Because currently, what is officially recognized as the most expensive collector's edition and video game in the world is, a, you mentioned it, Mark, the Saints Row 4 Super Dangerous Ward Ward Edition. Oh, God. And that one cost you $1 million, though. Can you put your little finger on your lips and say that? <laughs> <laughs> there was the Virgin Galactic Space Flight, full-size replica dubstep gun, a uh, hostage rescue experience, plastic surgery, spy training day, personal shopper, capsule wardrobe, seven nights at the top royal suite of the Burj Al Arab in Dubai, a week for two at the Jefferson Hotel in Washington, D.C., first class flights to Washington, D.C. and Dubai, Lamborghini Gallardo, new Toyota Prius plus one year's insurance, and a year's supercar membership. To be fair, that's probably... For a million dollars. Yeah, I was like, that, that's probably spot on, like. How yeah. if anyone bought it? I don't know, but I, I, I hope someone did. Because that one <laughs> that one was a cool one million dollars. Um, wow. Sorry, yeah. we can't say that without saying it like that. But that one is right now the most expensive video game. Unless this version is real. Now, if you are from Techland... Please confirm if this is real, because this would be the most expensive video game collector's edition of all time. For $9.99 million, which is £6.88 million, you could have the Dying Light, the following, Spotlight Edition. Now, have you guys heard of this? Yes. I I know know what's in this. (laughs) Right. The Dying Light, Spotlight Edition... Includes acting lessons, parkour lessons, driving lessons, and those will run you to a few thousand pounds. On top of that, you will have professional acting lessons with uh, Roger Craig Smith. You will have an original copy of the Dying, Dying Light, the movie script. You'll have four copies of Dying Light, the following enhanced edition. You'll become the voice of uh, a character in Dying Light, in particular, Carl Crane. You will have a FX makeup session to turn you into a zombie for any party. You'll have 10 VIP tickets for the opening night of Dying Light the Movie. You will have a personal trailer on the set of Dying Light the Movie. You'll be trained as a stuntman and in parkour or as a stunt double. You will have off-road driving courses, professional acting lessons. You'll also be part of the screening tour and you'll have a supporting role which will be an action scene and a speaking role in Dying Light, the movie. Wow. But do you get the game with it? You do get four copies of the game, the Enhanced Edition. Four copies, as many as that. Yes. But yeah, there's, a, there's been a few others, isn't there? Uh, didn't the Assassin's Creed have a solid gold edition or some ridiculous thing last year? Yeah, I think that one was a thing that uh, they brought out, but I think that one wasn't up in the million-dollar category. No, it wasn't as high as that. I mean... There is some other titles that I'm, I'm thinking off the top of my head, which I know are worth more than some of these lower down ones. Yes. The Neo Automata one I know is worth around £400, pounds. That's That's how much it's worth. How much did it sell at originally? Originally, I bought it for 180 Yeah, that's probably why. Yeah. You see what I mean? Um, another one which uh, doesn't get any attention because it's not in English is the Fire Emblem. Tharsia 776 Collector's Edition, which yes. normally goes for over a grand now. Yep. And I bought that for, for about 300 quid years ago, and I was just like, yeah, this will go under me bed, and I'll never look at it ever again, because I don't dare damage it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah I'm, it's... I'm like that. So, okay, I've got, I've got to say, just to round this off, what is the most expensive collector's edition you've got, Mark? And we can't ask this question to Andy, because he doesn't own collector's editions. Oh. Um, well, probably the Farseer one, the 776, since that's like about... It goes from anywhere from 400 to a grand. Like I said, I've got that black box near Automata one. I'm sure I've got something else as well, which is, went right up in value, but I can't remember what. Hmm. I, mean, I know the Nino Cooney one went up in value, the first one, didn't it? Yeah, but it's dropped in value again. Has it? Well, I know the second one, like, 
drop very quickly, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, I think that's about it. I don't know how much like the Xenoblade ones are, or the the One Piece Pirate Warriors ones are quite expensive as well. But I don't know how much of them are them are worth off the top of my head. Yeah, I think they went up and then they've kind of dropped or they've kind of faded into obscurity because they were quite like obscure games anyway. Except, like I said, it tends to be ones where, like I said, if you can get the game normal game cheap, I tend to find that the the collector's edition values do drop. Yep. Unless they've got something, that, like you said, that fits in with a collect like a collector's edition. For example, the Neo Automata one that's got a too big figure with it, which. Considering how popular the character is, you don't tend to you don't tend to see many figures of her. So I think that's probably one of the reasons that that is quite expensive, especially considering the, the release of the other two for about fifty quid each as well. Yep. Anyways, shall we end it at that? I haven't actually said mine, have I? Oh yeah, you haven't said yours. <laughs> <laughs> see, this is the thing. I'm not as crazy as Mark is to spend a lot of money on collector's editions. I'm more about collecting games themselves but uh i will collect some things and i do collect some things in particular uh i think the most expensive thing that i had at one point was uh the sonic adventure 2 collector's edition which was japanese only yeah for a start Mm. you know the one that you had the coin and stuff like that now the price of that fluctuated Uh, it went up to like 200 300 quid at one point and then dropped all the way down to like 40 quid so yeah. uh, I'm I haven't checked on the price of that for ages, but uh, I've got like the one that comes with the little uh, crystal laser cut thing of Sonic. Mm-hmm. That one uh, was one that I picked up, and I picked up the uh, Blast Blue Calamity Trigger Prestige Edition. Oh yeah, because that one was one that was weird. Where it went very cheap, then it went very expensive, didn't it? Yeah, I got it when it was very cheap. Yeah, because that went down to like ten quid cheap or something, didn't it? At one yep. point, uh, I picked it up for twenty quid. Yeah, wow. And then right after I got it for twenty quid, because I won it in one of my three o'clock in the morning eBay auctions. <laughs> <laughs> and right after I won it, all of a sudden I checked it like uh, a couple of weeks later, and the price had gone up over a hundred quid again. And I'm like, wow, I got a bargain. <laughs> Best time and ever. Yeah. But yeah, things like that. We'll we'll end that before somebody decides to rob us. Yes. yes, yes. (laughs) So, what's the most expensive collector's edition you own? Do let us know in the comments below. Or, do you think collector's editions are actually worth it? Again, let us know in the comments below. If you've enjoyed what you've been listening to, then like and subscribe. You can follow all the rest of our discussions that will be coming in the future. So, uh, until next time here on Press X, I have been Rob. I've been Andy. And I've been Mark. And just to clue you in, next time is all about merchandise. See you all later. Bye!